there is a path until we get to a fully autonomous uh, environment, yeah. right? So, um, but uh, we, we, we're going through this hybrid environment for the next 10, 20, I don't know how many years, right? Uh, which we're going to have many types of vehicles connected, not connected, autonomous, not autonomous, pedestrians, all this type of thing that somehow we need to operate together. Uh, this is what we call the transition phase. And in X amount of years, we're going to get supposedly to a fully autonomous uh, era. Now, even then, you still need to have something that will decide who is going first and that will implement the city's policies. So the theory right, about this uh, uh, kind of era is that you're going to have uh, the similar concept to uh, air traffic control. Okay. Right? Yeah. You not necessarily need the traffic light itself. Right? The traffic light, if you think about it, the traffic light today is the communication that allow, for instance, our system to tell you as a driver, hey, you can drive or you should stop. Yeah. And you are interpreting uh, th this information uh, with your eyes. You understand, hey, you know, it's green, I, 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 can, I can drive, red, I need to stop. When you move to a fully autonomous era, you not necessarily need to have these lights. You can use it, you can use communication. Mm. But and es essentially the idea is who is going first and what kind of policy I want to implement because again, the policy is up to the operators to decide. Welcome to the Mobility Innovators Podcast. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Mobility Innovators Podcast. I'm your host, Jaspal Singh. Mobility Innovator Podcasts invite key innovators in the transportation and logistics sector to share their experience and future forecasts. In this episode, we'll be discussing the importance of AI to optimize the traffic network. Our today guest is a co-founder and CEO of No Traffic. No Traffic is a company that focuses on developing technology for intelligent traffic management and optimization system. As a CEO, he manages a large team of industry leaders from various fields such as AI, machine vision, cybersecurity, engineering, bringing the team together and creating the most sophisticated traffic management platform. Prior to No Traffic, Tal was a business analyst at Beta Finance Consulting Firm, where he led complex projects in the transportation, infrastructure, and energy industry. I'm so happy to welcome Tell Chrysler, co-founder and CEO, No Traffic. Now it's time to listen and learn. Hello, Tell. It's great pleasure to have you on the show. I'm looking forward to our discussion on future of mobility and no traffic journey. Hey, it's great. Great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Great. Uh, so I would like to kickstart our discussion with your personal journey. And uh, like I mentioned, I'm very curious about journey so far. Uh, you did your bachelor degree in LLB and business and accounting from Richmond University. And your professional journey is very interesting as you work in a different role in different industry, ranging from project manager in Rafael Advanced Defense System, later security officer at the Royal Caribbean, and after that business analyst with Beta Finance. And top over the top and then you co-found this no traffic company with other two co-founder and I, I tell people uh, setting up transit uh, startup or I would say a mobility startup is very difficult. So I'm very curious to learn what motivate you to launch no traffic and, and I think the meaning is very clear no traffic you hate traffic and why did you pick these different career uh, over the period of time like something very interesting why you went through all different paths. Uh, great. So I think that um, I, I kind of started in early days um, kind of using a elimination in a way, right? So I knew it's going to go to the business, some kind of a business aspect, right? I didn't know what it, what exactly. Uh, I knew that I don't want to be a doctor and I don't want to be um, doing some kind of the uh, uh, other domains. So I knew I want to go to something around financial or something like that, but I didn't know exactly what it is. Um, so this is how it's kind of evolved. Uh, essentially, I went to school, to university, and I, I studied business law and accounting, uh, not because I wanted to be a lawyer or an accountant, but because I thought it's a great toolbox mm -hmm. for everyone, that, uh, anyone that wants to, uh, to do business, right? And I think that's essentially law and accounting is kind of like the basic, the, the fundamentals or the infrastructure of any, any entity uh, um, out there. So no matter what business you want to go to, it's good to have this kind of a, a, a toolbox. Um, 
so that that was kind of the idea. I had no idea what I'm going to do with that. I just knew it's it's going to be helpful one way or another. And therefore, when I kind of finished university, um, I could have go and do internship in, in some of the big law offices or accounting, etc. But I heard about um, a few partners that left one of the big uh, one of the biggest accounting office offices in Israel and opened up their own uh, consulting firm. Uh, dealing with a lot of what back then seems super cool uh, to me, uh, due diligence and, and uh, uh, valuation studies and feasibility studies. Uh, so a lot of finance from the government side, public sector, private sector, et cetera. And I thought it's a great opportunity to join as, as the first employee in a company and to have the ability to, uh, in a way to touch or to, uh, yeah. to, uh, uh, to get a taste in each and every of these aspects. Uh, I have to say that I was super lucky because uh, the, the people that I joined to, the one that established the company, I think are amazing people. And until today, we are good friends. And fast forward, after a, a few years in, in, in that company, I, I've kind of seen them coming uh, with a spark in their eyes every morning. Right, So they really like what they're doing on the, on the finance part. I didn't have this spark. Mm. Right, so I knew I need to go and do something different because I want to come motivated every morning, uh, like they are. So, again, I thought it's cool. I tried it. I had great fun. I was super lucky. I think that I've, I've got the best experience in the world. It's just that I kind of understood that I need to go to a different path. Um, and this is kind of um, where I left uh, uh, that company, Better Finance, and um, I met Oren Well accidentally uh, through a mutual friend that's until mm. today uh, working with us. Um, none of us is coming from the traffic management side. And Uriel, my, um, one of my founders, one of my co-founders and our CTO, uh, he was actually stuck at, sitting at an intersection in the middle of the night. It was 2016 or 2017. Um, and he was kind of frustrated why these systems are so inefficient. Mm. Now, back then, he was working for a cybersecurity company. Um, he, he, he's coming from the tech side. So he, since he's 14, he, he was uh, doing tech. And as an engineer, he was just starting to think, how can we do it differently? And how can we do it better? Um, a few, um, I think it was about a year after or something like that, he, the company that he was working for was acquired by IBM. Uh, and then he had the chance to go out and do something different. He decided not to stay. He got uh, interesting offers to stay working for IBM and he decided to leave. And he decided to start to work on this traffic management thing. Um, myself and all the failed co-founders joined him. We just thought it's, a, it's an interesting idea. We had no idea whatsoever about traffic management. We kind of just started to do kind of a market research and started to dive, uh, dive in. And we kind of realized there is a, a, a massive domain with hmm. so much impact on the physical world, which it, it's just mind blowing. However, this domain have not changed for such a long time. Yep. And the things that new technology, new methodology uh, can do in this sector is, I would, I would even say it's, it's kind of similar to transforming vehicles to driving without a driver, right? It's mm. massive impact. Um, so we, we, we just saw kind of like massive opportunity there and we started to work on it. Um, I would say, by the way, that if we were coming from this domain, we probably not starting the company because then we, we will probably realize how complicated things are, right? But when you don't know, sometimes it's a great advantage oh, because yeah. you just dive, <laughs> or you jump into the water and you simplify things. Mm. Um, and the number of times that we heard about things that are impossible or it's we're never going to work. Um, I, you know, I, I cannot even count these times and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of proud to say when, when you're coming with no, no limitations in your, in your mind about things and you just, you know, you look at the problem, yeah. you, 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 you kind of specify the problem specifically, right? We want to transform all the traffic lights to a one holistic connected network. Uh, that operate in real time and serve different types of, of road users based on different types of policies and preferences and events. And how do you do that, right? So you have a, you, you're missing communication, you're missing data, you're missing compute power. Uh, you need to have kind of a holistic system that that will take the decisions. You kind of starting to uh, break down the components and, and and the missing parts and design the solution 
Um, then you kind of overcome a lot of these challenges that were, were inherent to this domain, and we, we kind of had no idea that, that it's such a big thing. No, that's so, that's very true. That's very true. You know, coming from outside the industry, you come with the more opportunity and you come with the possibility. And you work in that industry, you come with the limitation. You say like, oh, this is not possible. Somebody tried it. It, it never happened. The legal, the regulation will never happen. But if you come from outside, you say like, why they are not changing? Why they are not bringing those change? Exactly, and I I think by the way it's true for a lot of a lot of companies that that disrupted um, traditional industries. You have someone from the outside that simply come and say, hey, you know why would why are we not doing it in a different way? <laughs> right? Uh, today we have better tools, better technology, um, better capabilities to do things that we could we we could not do a few years ago. Uh, so that's uh, I, I you know w- w- one of the funny story that we had that uh, w- one of our uh, board members, uh, his name is Nathan Gardner. So he invented uh, the first um, um, adaptive system in the world, the name hmm. OPA. And he, still, he, he, he spent a lot of uh, many years in the academia. Uh, and at some point he came to cities and he said, I can, I can solve your traffic uh, problems. And they said, go ahead. And then he said, okay, all you need to do is to, is to put one mainframe computer in every intersection. And then, then we can start to make it work. Now, obviously, it was not a real option, right? Yeah. And luckily, today we have these these smartphone devices, right, that you can put easily uh, same amount of compute power without the need of these huge mainframes. Uh, so things things change. Um, we we we're moving forward, and therefore the tools that we can use uh, can open up a whole new world of possibilities. No, that's very true. That's very true. I mean, I think sometimes it's the timing. It's the right time for idea. And actually, that's my my next question is. Why you think it's uh, it's important to build no traffic now? What's have changed in this uh, in the market, and what exactly no traffic do, and what's his mission to transform the traffic management? How how it's working? What is company solving the traffic problem in the city? Um, great. So I, I'll start by saying that um, first of all, we we need to start to look at things in a more holistic way, right? Think about mobility not just as like different verticals or different pieces. Yeah. It's, it's like a puzzle, but every piece in the puzzle have, have these connectors that allow it to integrate with the other parts, right? What happened today is that most of the verticals thinking about their own narrow aspect. And therefore, in, in the context of a puzzle, it will, never, it will never connect. It will never come up together. And this is, this is one of the things that we, when we are thinking about traffic, in general, in mobility, we're thinking about how everything can work together. Think how efficient it is when the vehicles are communicating with, with, with each other, with the, with the traffic, uh, uh, with the different uh, applica- ride-hailing applications, yep. when everything is kind of more holistically. Um, so that, that, that that's kind of, I would say, our agenda. Uh, at No Traffic, we, we developed a mobility platform that today consider as, as uh, top in the market. And our mission is simply to revolutionize urban mobility uh, by developing this leading uh, a platform for signalized intersections with the goal of uh, reducing emissions, uh, saving lives, and uh, obviously increase efficiency and enable the uh, future of, of mobility services or the next generation of mobility services, I would say. Um, so that, that's kind of how we build our product to be able not just to solve different use cases, but also be a part of a much bigger picture. Amazing. Amazing. Now you mentioned something very important is the life, the accident, the fatality, and also the emission. And I think that's are the two pressing issue right now we are facing. In fact, when I was studying the data, I found like 1.35 million people died in road accident every year. And in mm-hmm. this like a aeroplane crashing every hour. And one of the challenges is not about people behavior, but also how the traffic system is organized. And second is people are losing kind of 51 hours in traffic jam every year. So it's kind of a two days of your life. You are just wasting. We can, we can use that two days of life, do so many other things. So what are some of the key challenge that traditional traffic management system face? Because you mentioned the system hasn't been upgraded over the period of time. I think the first traffic light was installed in London in 8060 and nothing have changed much. And how does no traffic technology address these challenges? Like how you are solving, which the earlier system couldn't be able to solve. 
other important thing I would like to ask you is like, if you can share some case studies where no traffic has actually led to a significant improvement in the traffic flow in the city, like how you solve the traffic flow problem in the city. Sure. Um, so first, to your first point about the number of fatalities and, 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 and congestion, etc., I think that in order to really solve that, again, it's a much bigger play. So we need to have much better public transportation and we need to have uh, uh, better infrastructure, better traffic traffic management to support, right? And we need to have the ability to communicate between the different verticals that, that using yep. the roads and, and, and uh, uh, pedestrians, et cetera. So it's not just like one thing that we're going to improve and everything is going to be amazing. It's a much, much, much bigger effort for humanity, right? Now, within this bigger effort, there are different stakeholders. Um, or, or different different uh, components that should should operate together, and we are from the traffic management side seeing ourselves as the component that should bring this innovation or advancement uh, to enable uh, uh, to all these parts to work together. Uh, so, the way that we we seeing it is that on the traffic management side, one of the biggest issues is that we're using the same methodology for the last hundred years or so, right? So we're still using uh, timing plans. Um, in a um, in a dynamic world, right, or in dynamic environment, so there is not really any, I would say, correlation between whoever used the roads and the system that managed these road users. Uh, traffic management systems originally designed for vehicles, and now the environment is becoming much more complex. So yeah. first of all, you have more vehicles on the road, but you have also different types of vehicles. You have mm -hmm. public transportation, you have emergency vehicles. Uh, uh, you have freight, uh, you have different types of objects, and then you also have pedestrians and more pedestrians and bicycles uh, and scooters and various types of, of, of things that I don't even know what they are, but it's something with a wheel or two or three, right? And somehow all of these things need to operate together. So there is kind of a key principle that uh, uh, start to be uh, more common, which means that the goal is to, to move more people and goods from one place to another, from point yeah. A to point B. And by the way, that's the that's the idea behind prioritization for public transportation, that yeah. on a single yeah. bus, you can move more people rather than three vehicles, for yeah. instance. Uh, the average capacity of a private vehicle is 1.2, 1.3 people per vehicle. In a, in a single bus, you can feed like 50 people or so, right? You can, you can uh, put more. And if, if we're gonna follow this idea of moving more people and goods from point A to point B, and now the question is, how do you do that in the most effective way? And how you also take into consideration various uh, things that are happening on a daily basis, accident, incident, road blockage, different type of weather, uh, baseball games, uh, protests, uh, tons of stuff that's going on, right? Construction, uh, since the world is dynamic. And if you think about, about it in that context, you, you will get to the point that you need to think about traffic lights, not as just a solution that need to change the lights on and off, but as something more holistic that need to operate as a network, mm. right? And these network have to communicate between all the different nodes, uh, implement different types of policies, right? Who, who is going first, the ambulance or the private vehicle or the pedestrians or the bus? And if the bus is empty, it's not full. And if it's yeah. in delay of the schedule or if it's ahead of the schedule, um, there's so many interesting questions that, that you, you need to take into consideration. And then you come up with a very complex system, right? It should be, you know, how, how do you implement it, right? How do you execute this kind of a thing? And then it also needs to react to various things. If you have a road blockage, it needs to identify or to know about it. Um, again, construction, whatever. So this is what, that, that, that was kind of what, like what, where we came from. And this is what we designed and developed over several years already. Uh, a platform that have the ability to retrofit these traffic lights, connect them through the cloud uh, uh, to uh, kind of create a, a, a network between, between all the different intersections and allow them to operate in a fully automated way based on the policies that's coming from the operator. So that, that's important to emphasize. We are providing a management tool um, and we are not policy makers, meaning that any agency can define their own policies. And I'll mm -hmm. give you some examples to your question. 
So some cities wanted to reduce congestion. Uh, it's kind of like the, uh, let's call it the obvious case. They had a, a, a huge queue in a certain corridor and they want to get rid of it. Uh, so in the city of, of, of Tucson, for example, uh, we deployed our system on what we called uh, uh, optimization or, or automated mode. Uh, the corridor is, is run fully on automatically and it cut, it killed the queue of about a mile, right? A queue that was there every uh, every peak time, uh, 8 a.m., 4 p.m., have gone. Mm. Uh, and that's because the system is now operating fully autonomously, understanding how many vehicles are there, how many are coming from where, and do not work based on, on timing plans that were predefined. Now, in other cities, uh, in another city, um, uh, the goal was to increase safety, oh. for instance. That was the prime goal. And in that city, we managed to reduce the number of red light runners, the vehicles that are, are crossing the intersection in, in uh, red light. We managed to reduce it by 70%. Mm. So essentially, we reduced the probability for an accident by about 70%. Right? So that was their goal. And in an, a different city, their goal was to prioritize pedestrians over vehicles. Mm. That, that was the policy. And then we managed to cut the pedestrians' delay time by close to a half. So pedestrians are waiting less, right? Um, it's important to say that we managed to do it without affecting the, the, the delay time of the vehicle. So there is kind of this misconception in the traffic space that if you're prioritizing one certain approach, main, main street versus side street or pedestrian versus vehicle, then, then uh, um, someone else will kind of pay this uh, pay for this prioritization. It's kind of a, a short blanket effect. Yeah, and we, we managed to prove that it's not it's not right. All right, so we managed to both prioritize pedestrians or improve uh, dramatically corridor without affecting the side street or without affecting the main street in terms of the vehicles, etc. Now, it's important to say that if the goal in in the case with the pedestrians was to improve the uh, uh, vehicles flow, uh, we could have probably improved it more. Hmm. But if we look at the base case, where we started from, uh, the situation now is much better. Pedestrians waiting less, uh, vehicles are waiting less, uh, much better than what was before we came. Well, that That's amazing. Like all three case studies, and I, I love your point because the city need to define its objective. You can't just say, okay, just solve the traffic problem. But what exactly you want to do, whether you want to reduce, increase the safety, or you want to reduce the pedestrian time, or you want to reduce the queue, and, you know, generally in traditional way, that what the thinking was that if you want to increase the cycle time, you have to take the time from other cycle. So reduce the exactly. timing of other. I mean, I, I, I used to work for Delhi BRT corridor when it was launched. And one of the thing Delhi BRT corridor failed in 2010 was the traffic signaling because we couldn't manage. Every arm was full. There was so much of traffic. And, you know, when the queue formation happened, people tend to do more violation because you became more anxious and you want to be jump the traffic light or you want to run through the traffic lights and more accident happen. But the moment you bring some normalcy on the system, things calm down. People became much more patient because they know they will be able to clear the traffic soon. Yeah. And, and it's important to emphasize there are always trade-offs, hmm. right? There are always trade-offs. Uh, the trade trade-offs are defined by the operator. If now the system needs to take a decision, who is going first? You have one pedestrian and one private vehicle. It's up to the operator to define the priorities. And obviously, if the pedestrian is going before the vehicle, then there is a trade-off. Yeah. However, when you move to a real-time system, uh, in comparison to uh, systems that based on timing plans, the improvement for anyone is, is dramatic. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, and I think that that's kind of like the... Uh, that's probably the biggest the biggest shift that this industry have to go through because things that are based on timing plans uh, in a dynamic world are, are by definition less effective than systems that operate in real time based on what's really happening on the road. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I love your word about, you know, the, the dynamic world because that's that's very true. And we have so many different vehicles. In, in some of the country, like in India, we used to have like 17 different type of vehicle at the same time on the road, like 17 different. And and in other part of the world also, now we have micro scooter, micro mobility, bikes, pedestrian, cars, you know, autonomous vehicles. So it's it's going crazy. Our world, world is moving in a different direction. 
So now, you know, computer vision is a critical component for no traffic technology. Like you mentioned how you're retrofitting these uh, devices in the system and monitoring in a real time. How does your system handle challenges such as varying lighting condition? Because sometimes weather is bad, uh, there is a rain or snow or, or you know, the traffic is very uh, unpredictable. So there is uh, occlusion of ensure accurate traffic monitoring analysis, how you do in a different varying weather condition. And are you facing any compatibility and interoperability issue? Because you said you retrofit the existing traffic light, you're not installing new. And I'm pretty sure there must be some interoperability issue. And uh, in a cities where we have so many diverse traffic management system, how you address that challenge? Um, <clears throat> so it's a, it's, it's a really good question because um, it, it took us a few good years to develop the uh, uh, the platform. And um, we almost every year doing a kind of a talk uh, in uh, together with NVIDIA in the annual conference, uh, talking about the difference between theory and practice. Mm. In theory, uh, things are, are super easy. You take a computer vision algorithm, you run it on a camera, uh, you detect the vehicles, then you take some decisions. Everything is sunny and nice uh, and exactly the right angles and height and everything is, is amazing. The real world, on the other hand, is, is, is what I call a bunch of edge cases. Mm. Uh, in the real world, uh, you have so many edge cases and so many things that you need to solve in order to really bring a product to the market in a scalable way, right? To, f to fully commercialize it. So it's starting from different angles and, and, and light uh, conditions and glares from the road, uh, fog, uh, birds that landing on the, uh, yeah. uh, on the sensor and, and blocking the line of sight, uh, anything that you can imagine. And, 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 and you will tell me, yeah, but how many times it's happened? So not a lot of times, but there's so many events that essentially it become many times, right? <laughs> that, that, that's the real world. And it took, again, it took us a few good years to develop the, the, the platform because we had to find solutions, how to mitigate and overcome this, these challenges. Um, cause, cause there are so many, uh, uh different types of, of, of challenges and edge, edge cases. And how you design your system and, and, and the hardware and the algorithms, et cetera, uh, to be able to handle this kind of situation, right? By the way, that's one of the reasons that our sensors include both camera and radar, hmm. uh, because in places with like rough weather, et cetera, um, extreme fog or snow, um, um, or these kind of things, you're operating a critical infrastructure. You cannot say, now I'm not operating because there's snow, hmm. right? And therefore, we, we, we managed to get to a point uh, that we, we are able to detect close to 100% of the time um, all the road users uh, out there uh, unrelated to, to the type of weather, etc. Uh, so we, we today deployed in, in some places with extreme weather from, from Canada, uh, obviously, to uh, some uh, place in the US. And uh, it's, kind, it's kind of amazing that in some cases, the algorithms today manage to detect things that we as human beings can, cannot see in a human eye level. Mm. Uh, it, 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 can, it, it can detect uh, uh, better than like better than what we better can see. Human. Yeah. Uh, so that that's uh, um, that's amazing. Now the other thing is uh, about interoperability. So I think that uh, going back to the this puzzle example. So if I'm I'm kind of taking it just for the traffic management space, it's actually kind of similar, right? It's kind of a subset of the, 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 the whole mobility ecosystem, but just in a traffic management space, it's a very hardware driven industry and every, every provider or vendor is providing a, a single component. Yeah. And they were not designed to operate together. Mm. So one of the biggest challenges that we've seen with agencies is this interoperability issue. We literally, Worked with with, with with cities and places that that really wanted to improve traffic, and they went out there and purchased the the, the, the shiniest uh, pieces of hardware in the market uh, in a lot of money. And when they uh, tried to make all of them somehow work together, um, every vendor said like he need to make it work, and the other one said no no he need to speak with me. No. And uh, a few years after, this stuff still lying in a cabinet. Real story. And therefore, what we said is, how can we overcome this, this uh, interoperability or integration challenge, which, which usually comes from the fact that you have a lot of different devices 
Uh, you don't even know where the problem is. How do you maintain it? Who 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 is it for? Right. Yeah. Um, so the approach that we took is full ownership. Mm. Uh, we do need to integrate with the traffic light controller, but this is something that we we kind of uh, serve this capability um, with our platform. So you have the ability to connect in a plug and play way to any controller in the market. But beside of that, we created the whole ecosystem uh, in our platform uh, via our marketplace that can provide you all of these different types of solutions in a click of a button. Right, so going back to the consumer world uh, before the smartphone, right? You had a calculator, calculator in your house, yeah. a camera, a flashlight, etc. You couldn't expect the manufacturer of the trap of the uh, uh, of the flashlight and the calculator to work right. on the integration. <laughs> it will never work, right? And this is exactly how the traffic space look. What we have done is what what the smartphone has done, right? Now it's all application on a single platform. And now all of them are working nicely together. Amazing. I, I love this your is... analogy. It's like instead of pushing calculator manufacturer to install an LED light, just build a new phone and bring everything yeah. together. Yeah, it's it's a huge change, right? In, 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 in the conception of the market, but it's essential to build it in the right way in order to make it work. And it's not just about this ability to to, to operate many different applications or services on a single platform. It's also about other aspects like service, right? Suddenly you have a connected platform. You can provide service over the air. You can solve things in, in a couple of hours that mm. on, the, on the normal market before we came could have taken a few weeks, right? So the level of service to the entities, to the customers went dramatically up. Um, the ability to do updates and upgrades, to support them, to alert them when there's something going on, uh, it's 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 completely changed the way that we are looking at traffic, traffic applications, etc. Amazing, amazing. No, I I agree with you. You know, sometimes it's hard to find out who is the right person within the company to solve that problem. So sometimes you spend like weeks to just find out the right person, and and with technology now it's becoming much and more plug and play, and you can solve it with the click of button rather than waiting for people to answer your email or deliver something. So you can do much better with that. Now, one important thing you mentioned now, the system are becoming much more intelligent. Now they can see even better than what we can see with the human eye. And I think that's the role of data. So data is playing such a crucial role now to train and improve these AI algorithm. Can you share some insight about how you, know, you are using machine learning algorithm in a no traffic solution? And how do you train and fine tune these algorithm to adopt to different traffic scenario and optimize signal timing? Like you said, theory and practice is completely different. In theory, you can create 10 different scenario, but when you put the system into practice, it has to play in the real time. So how you are using data and training your algorithm to be more dynamic every day and improving every day? Great. So um, we, we have few, few aspects of, of, of learning algorithms in our, uh, in our platform. Uh, one is actually on the detection side. We have a, an active learning uh, mechanism that basically running a few uh, neural networks uh, simultaneously. And every time that they do not agree about something, um, that, that then when, when you have this kind of a, a conflict, then we know that this is a, a piece of data that we need to look at and then uh, um, uh, retrain the algorithms based on uh, the investigation that we had after we understood what was the issue. Right, so this whole process is automatic, and, and what it causes is kind of like an automatic uh, improvement of the uh, the detection algorithms. The other thing that we developed, part of our core technology, related more to the optimization side, is the ability to uh, create simulations that simulate the real world, or or or, or kind of have the ability uh, to project what's going to happen in the real world. Uh, in a very high accuracy. Right? And that's super complex because most of the simulations today um, take a lot of assumptions. So you take traffic count and then you just divide it linearly over an hour. Yeah. Right? But this is how, no, just as an example, right? Or, or you can divide it for different type, different batches, but again, it's, it's unrelated to how traffic is really behaving. And therefore, to calibrate your simulations and to create them more close to reality, this is really a, diff a really difficult process that we had to go through 
in order to develop our algorithms so we can know in a, in a, a, a high certainty that the improvement is significant before we even deploy them in the field. Mm. Right, so that, that's that's another process that we uh, we had to go through um, in order to know in a uh, uh, to, to to get a high confidence that that we are on the right track before we even deploy something uh, in a, in a in a corridor. No, that that's great to know that it's a there is a self improvement mechanism involved in the process, so you don't need to every time go and look. It's the machine itself is telling, okay, there is some problem, and I need to improve and go back and, and update the database and, and improve. But do you also need to sometime intervene and you find some problem area where you feel like, oh, machine is not working in the right way or the AI is not working in the right way. Like I, I tell people like it's now the human intervention require in AI. Earlier it was AI intervention in human work, but it's other way around now. Now human need to intervene and you feel like, okay, something is going wrong. How do you do that? So it's, um, again, it, it, it's, it's a good question because the, again, the world is complex. The real world is complex. Um, almost any technology have, have different types of edge cases and things, as I mentioned before, that, that you kind of encounter and you say, hey, now we can we, we need to, to add this kind of capability or, or ability to react, right? Um, so there are obviously some cases when we're finding out something new, it can be like weird angles. Uh, it, it can be uh, places that we have some... Uh, 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 stuff that blocking the line of sight, or I mean, it, it can be many, many things that we uh, we can see um, happening. Uh, I, I can say that the vast majority of scenarios, uh, since we have some uh, quite a time on the road, I would say, uh, the vast the vast majority of scenarios already being covered. Uh, but in in some places, we do finding like uh, weird. Uh, 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 um, kind of geometry of an intersection, right? Mm. Or places that have like difficult places to uh, to mount the sensors, and then we have to go to some to be creative uh, and to to kind of coming with like weird angles uh, that, that sometimes can make the uh, detection a bit more uh, tricky. Um, so yeah, but that 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 that's part of life. Uh, not all intersection look the same. Uh, there is no standardization on how do you need to build how how to build an intersection, right? And in many cases, you just have limitation by the uh, geometry in the, in, in the field. And we have yeah. to just work with that. That's very true. That's very true. Not, not all, not, I mean, no intersection is same. Everything has unique perspective and unique user profile. That's also make it different. Yeah. So I would say that again, the vast, it's like 80, 20, right? Or even uh, vast majority of them all have the same, I would say parameters, uh, et cetera, but you all the time have some you know, in some city that they have some kind of a very uh, uh, challenging uh, uh, um, intersection or something, and suddenly you have kind of like weird geometry that you 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 not encountered in the past, and 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 you you have to solve it. That that's right? true. That's true. <laughs> the other puzzle I think you need to solve is how to work with this B two G and B two B space because uh, no traffic is working with uh, mostly with cities and government, and I, I know it's not easy space to work with. So how does no traffic collaborate with city transportation agencies and other stakeholders to implement the solution? And what do you think the city should do? Because I was originally going to ask you about what challenges and consideration you face with the city, but I would ask in other ways, like what should city do to be more productive and work with these kind of solution in more productive way, like how they can build capacity in house to implement these kind of a uh, technology led solution. Um, so I, I would say that you, you kind of, you, you have to understand how they operate, how agencies operate, because I wouldn't call it kind of like a, a difficult to work with or something like that. You just, you need to understand how they operate and then to adapt mm -hmm. yourself to make it, uh, to make the process, uh, to, to simplify. For example, one of the agendas that we took as a company, uh, we call it zero homework to the public sector. Okay. Meaning... You give me a go, I'm going to make sure it's going to work. I'm going to own the entire problem. I'm going to make sure it's going to work. No matter if that's a intersection with a traffic light controller from the 70s, no communication, middle of the desert, whatever. You know, we, 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 we're going to make it, we're going to make it fly. Um, now, in order to be able to do it, we had to solve a lot of challenges on, on our side, right? On the product side. So that's, that, that's why it was kind of 
complex to develop this solution because it's have to take into consideration many aspects that may or not be may, may be exist or may not uh, that, that that we have to complement. And I think that, that th this agenda make our entire uh, operation with with the uh, public entities uh, much easier because if you go to any city or even company, right, and ask them to do a major change, mm. um, deploying communication, right? Uh, that's a big effort, right? It's a big effort. And if you avoid this kind of ask and you're just telling them, look, give me the go. I'm going to make sure it's going to work. Uh, it's make their life simpler. Yeah. So I think it, 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 it just make everything much more smoother. They appreciate that, um, and it make our operation uh, way, 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 way more uh, faster and 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 also enjoyable uh, to the other side. I I love your point. No homework to the public sector because if you don't give them like no no kids love homework, so public sector also if you give them a list of tasks to do before implementing a project, they will they will feel more puzzle and you know lack of support. But if you tell them okay you don't need to do anything. We will do everything for you, and they will like. Okay, we have full support. Yeah, by the way, it's true for any organization, right? If you go to any large corporate and you tell them that they need to change their cloud architecture, so you'll be able to provide yeah. your solution, uh, probably it's not going to happen the day after, right? <laughs> uh, so, so I think this kind of approach that means that I gonna I gonna make it as as, as seamless and easy uh, for the other side to implement. Uh, we find it very very helpful. True. I, I agree with you. And I think this is a very good point uh, for any company or any startup, you know, solving a problem that you should make sure that less homework for the other client, for the client, you know, yeah. because then then the process will be smooth. Now, initially, you know, in, in the beginning, you mentioned about the importance of public transport and really like your point about if you really solve the problem of fatality, traffic congestion, emission, we have to put more people into public transit. And and I think there is a lot of movement going on now to have new project in light rail infrastructure and bus rapid transit in US. The federal government is now spending a lot of money into the bus rapid transit system. And I think uh, I have seen many bus rapid transit or light rail project fail because of the traffic signal, because the traffic signal priority is not done properly. And if you don't uh, take care of that component uh, very early in the project, it will it will fail. So can you share the role of uh, TSP in improving the efficiency of public transportation? And what advice do you give to the city official or transit planner or policymaker who are considering adopting TSP? Because not all TSPs are same. So if they are looking to install a new uh, traffic signal priority system, what should they keep in mind uh, before procuring these new systems? So um, I think it's, it's again, it's, it goes back to the more holistic thing. Because uh, if you just look traditionally on transient priority and you just um, um, specifically want when a, a bus is coming to get a higher priority uh, and then it leaves and it go back to timing plan, but the intersection have no idea that now it's, it's disrupted the traffic timing, the, the yeah. timing plan, sorry. So now you created some kind of, a, you, you took it out of balance, right? And you, you affected the other types of road users. So if you look at on a on a kind of an, on a macro aspect on a grid level, uh, you you create so many disruptions um, in in the grid, which causing a lot of inefficiency. And obviously, there's the the more tricky question of what kind of capacity you want to prioritize when, which mm -hmm. corridor capacity delay schedule, etc. So many parameters that that was talking about as well, right? Because you don't want necessarily to prioritize any bus just because it's a bus. Um, so the way that we are looking at is, is again, in a simple way, think about a network and think about various types of, of objects that, that using, uh, uh, using the, uh, this network and some of them need to get different attention hmm. or some of them in other world need to get different type of priority. Some of them, by the way, need to get even higher, uh, higher type of priority, like emergency yeah. vehicles, right? And you can define the level of priority to any type of road user. And it's important to say when we, unless you give a, a, a preemption, which basically means I shut down everything, I let the, the ambulance or fire truck to pass, with the other ones, it's not necessarily going to be the case. The case is gonna be more related to statistic of, of like averages. 
how long in average the bus is, is being delayed, how, how long it taking to go from point A to point Z, and how can you reduce this travel time over yeah. time, by the way, on a city level. So I think this is kind of like the parameters that need to be measured. And again, the trade-off here is what's the cost that you're going to pay hmm. uh, in terms of the uh, 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 how much uh, how much level of priority you provide versus how do you impact hmm. the rest of the traffic. The other thing is, after you finish with this prioritization, how do you go back to normal operation as soon as possible? Yeah. Right? So if you've done a, a preemption, you, you shut down the intersection for an ambulance to pass, for example, the second after it passed, you need to understand what's going on now, how many objects are waiting from each direction, how many pedestrians, how many bicycles, how many bikes, how many uh, private cars, etc., and kind of recalculate what you want to do. Because if mm -hmm. you go back to timing plan, the timing plan is by definition not effective at the moment. You have no idea what's going on. The situation have, have been completely disrupted. Right. So this is kind of how we look at it. More of a, on a macro level, um, one of our advantages is the ability to run simulations that can help you define these balances, how much you want to prioritize something versus the trade-off for other things. However, this is on the policy level, right? That's up to the operator to define. What our system does is once you set the policy, we're going to make it run in the most effective way. Right, in the most the optimal way to improve delay time or reduce travel time, uh, et cetera. And also safety parameters and, and, and other policies that can be set by the operator. Amazing. No, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, is like uh, what happened after the priority vehicle pass, like how you will bring back the system into life. And the other important point you mentioned about is uh, how much priority you want to give because uh, sometimes the bus doesn't need priority. If it's on time, it's working on schedule or probably it's before time. So you actually want to delay it a little bit to make it schedule on time. So how you can do that? No, that's amazing. Exactly. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. And 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 I agree with you. It's a, it's a policy level decision which city need to define. The technology can solve anything, but how the policy want to deal with that issue. So I think that one of the challenges today is to have enough data to take these decisions and mm -hmm. uh, define a policy. Because you need to see some examples of assuming that you're providing buses the highest priority, what would happen, mm. right? What would happen the day after? And if you give, let's say, 50% priority or 75 or whatever, um, if you play with this uh, 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 button of priority, theoretically, what, what will happen? What will be the impact? What will happen to the delay time of the other vehicles and other road users, et cetera? And I think that this is something that severely lack today uh, that are really important to take these decisions. Uh, by the way, the priority level can also be differentiated because if the bus is in a serious delay in the schedule, yeah. you might want to give it higher priority. If it's not, you might gonna want to uh, give it a, a list of priority. And also there's other aspects. We talked about priority, but there's also the aspect of the queue, mm. right? So if you have an emergency vehicle coming in, um, if you know the, the entire route of the vehicle, Right, you can clear the queue before it comes and dramatically allow it to uh, to get from point A to B, from point A to point point B faster. Uh, if you have no idea about the route or you don't know that the vehicle is even there because the queue is so long, um, then it's just going to wait, mm. right? And by knowing where it's going to go, you can kill the queues or, or, or cut the queues way before it even comes. Yeah, no, that's that sounds like easy, but I I can imagine it's so complex. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. You... It, it, it's easy in, in theory. Again, practice wise, you have so many different types of of of, of conflicts yeah. that you need to solve uh, in order to really make it happen and and to make sure, by the way, that you don't um, uh, get into a, a starvation situation, for instance. Mm. Right, that you let some drivers to wait for a long time. And then they will start to drive and create a safety event because they think that the traffic light is not working fine or something similar. That, so that there's happens. also kind of a psychological as psychological 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 aspect that uh, need to be also taken care of. It has a big play. I I remember uh, in many of the you know developing part of the world that's how it happened. Like people don't trust the traffic light. And they start uh, just driving the vehicle on their own and don't care what it's whether it's green or red. So it's it's a big challenge. You have to have that trust in the system, and that only come when you see it's working efficiently. 
Yeah, and I think that the next the next leap, the next generation will be when this, this system will tell you straight to the vehicle uh, how long uh, are you going to wait, for right. example. And then you know that the system is working fine because you have this countdown in the vehicle. Or what re drive, what speed you should drive at in order to cross in, in green light, right? So all this V2X uh, um, thing, technology, when it comes to play, I think it would be very beneficial because uh, to your point, it would provide the indication and the confidence for drivers that the system is working. Uh, perhaps now we're doing something else, but it is working. You are being taken care of. You are being considered by the system. You're being detected by the traffic light. It, it, it knows that you are there. Um, and you know exactly kind of like what's what's going on. Yeah, no, I, I think you mentioned the right point about V2X. And the other big change we are going to see is this autonomous mobility. I mean, in San Francisco, now Cruz and Waymo, they can run 24 into 7 commercial operation. And and V2X will be important part of autonomous mobility. And and I think V2V also will play a big role in, in coming days. So my question is, like, how do you think the role of traffic light or traffic signal will change in the autonomous mobility world and sometimes i wonder like do we still need traffic signal in the future like do we really need signal because if the vehicles are talking to each other and saying hey i'm passing you wait and you wait and i'm passing how, how do you think that world i mean i i know i'm thinking very futuristic approach but uh, but do you are already thinking about those things those scenarios yeah, we, we, we're entertaining ourselves with the whole <laughs> discussions and questions about how the future is going to look like. And um, look, the thing is that even if you're looking at a, obviously the, the, there is a path until we get to a fully aut autonomous uh, environment, yeah. right? So, um, but uh, we, we, we're going through this hybrid environment for the next 10, 20, I don't know how many years, right? Uh, which we're going to have many types of vehicles connected, not connected, autonomous, not autonomous, pedestrians, all these type of things that somehow need to operate together. Uh, this is what we call the transition phase. And in X amount of years, we're going to get supposedly to a fully autonomous uh, era. Now, even then, you still need to have something that will decide who is going first mm -hmm. and that will implement the city's policies. So the theory, right, about this uh, uh, kind of era is that you're going to have uh, the similar concept to uh, air traffic control. Okay. Right? Yeah. You not necessarily need the traffic light itself, right? The traffic light, if you think about it, the traffic light today is the communication that mm -hmm. allow, for instance, our system to tell you as a driver, hey, you can drive or you should stop. Yeah. And you are interpreted. Uh, th this information uh, with your eyes, you understand, hey, you know, it's green, I, 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 can, I can drive, red, I need to stop. When you move to a fully autonomous era, you not necessarily need to have these lights. You can use it, you can use communication. Mm. But and es essentially the idea is who is going first and what kind of policy I want to implement because again, the policy is up to the operators to decide. Now, if you look at all the academia and, 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 and uh, uh, articles, et cetera, all of them are talking about something that we call um, slot-based optimization, meaning that you not necessarily have to provide 20 seconds to the east approach. I can just tell you, hey, you're approaching to the intersection. Uh, you're going to get a slot of, of, of a couple of seconds. You need to drive in this, this and that speed, and then you're just going to cross. And then you're, you're going to see all these cool simulation that we <laughs> see that vehicles are coming from all the approaches um, everywhere. But also then you need to have something that will take care of pedestrian, for instance. Mm. And God forbid, also non-connected objects. Yeah. Uh, if you left your house without a cell phone, I don't believe that none of us believe that you should be doomed <laughs> to die. Uh, also, and therefore, somehow someone need to take care of, of you, of me, of, mm. of our kids, whatever, uh, if they left home without uh, uh, something that transmits their location or something. Now, what we are building today is exactly this. Mm. Now, today, the only way that we can connect, again, is through the traffic lights. But if you take tomorrow all the traffic lights out, the same optimization algorithms, the same infrastructure that we are lying today um, uh, uh, is providing this kind of uh, ability. Mm. No, that's, that's an amazing answer because I never thought about the role of air traffic control in a traffic signal sense. It's like, it's not just directing but it's giving priority who should come first who should go later and then 
the pedestrian because not all the pedestrian will have some signal to communicate and sometimes it's it's not possible like you are in a different place or different uh city and it's not possible to communicate so how the and i think you rightly mentioned you can actually remove the traffic signal but the the system will remain there for the priority to set up the priority who will come first who will move and the simulations show that you need nothing the vehicle will just move around but but that's like too sci-fi and and i think i think what you're saying is making much more practical sense than than what simulations show yeah and 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 um i uh, encourage you next time that you see this kind of a simulation uh ask the the person that show you uh where are the pedestrians where are the bicycles <laughs> Where are the other types of road users? Because it's easy to ignore them. But usually in urban environments, uh, this is how the world works. You also have these uh, creatures that's called pedestrians that are there, right? And they need to, to get service as well. Um, and, and actually, we see that we're starting to have more and more and more types of mobility. Mm -hmm. So perhaps in 20 or 30 years, it's not just going to be pedestrians and bicycles. It's going to be 20 other types of things, right, that we need to take, take uh, our care as well, take care of as well. Yeah, no, no, I'm thinking about those simulation and I never saw any pedestrian. So you are absolutely right. <laughs> they never show pedestrian. They just show vehicle <laughs> moving around. No, amazing. Uh, so now tell, we discuss about traffic, transportation and a lot of other stuff, but I just want to discuss about your entrepreneurial journey because it has been amazing. Like you share, how did you start this company? How did you met your co-founder? So I can say you had a so far really amazing entrepreneurial journey and uh, you have built this global startup now. I mean, you're working in different countries. What advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneur or innovator who are interested in making a positive impact in the field of transportation urban planning? Because it's not an easy area. Like I told you in the beginning, starting something in mobility and transportation space is not easy. So what advice do you give to people? Like how should they solve that problem and where should they start? I, I would frankly frankly say that I think that doing something that you don't like is way more difficult than any domain. Hmm. Right? If you wake up in the morning and, and do something that you don't feel you like to do, I think that this is by far the most <laughs> difficult thing. And um, and therefore, I think that if you if you if you find a space, a domain, a problem that you love, um, and you wake up in the morning and you don't you don't think about it like I'm 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 waking up for work. It's like nursing a child. It is super challenging, mm. but you don't think about it in that way. You just it, you're nursing a child, right? Uh, so it's the same thing here. You build a company, you're nursing the company. It's like another child. Uh, it's 24-7, it's weekends, it's holidays, whatever. But if you don't think about it in that context, if you think about it in a context of, I want to I wanna take a, a concept, an idea, and bring it to life, uh, and 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 uh, transform it to a product, to, into a company, and you like what you do. I think that's the uh, that's the most important thing. And if if you're not in this kind of concept, it will be very very difficult. I agree. I I think nursing a child is a good analogy to say it's uh, you know because it's not easy to raise a child and it's not easy to <laughs> build a company. <laughs> exactly right. But I mean, you do what you need to do. If you need to wake up for your kid in the middle of the night. You, is what you do right <laughs> you so, you have no excuse you have to do it <laughs> exactly so same thing here but you, you just need to come prepare that it take a lot of effort but if you like it like you like your kids uh and when you do that you don't think about how how um how miserable you are you think about well my kid is now he needs me right um so i think that that's kind of like the make it much more easier in a way to to kind of build something uh no matter in, in which domain amazing no i agree with you it's it's uh it's far more difficult to do what you don't like uh than than do anything if you like something just just go for it and do it now no traffic has recently raised 50 billion million dollar uh it will be billion one day but right now 50 million <laughs> in series b Funny. so congratulations yeah. to you and team uh and i think in total you have raised 75 million dollar which is Remarkable because it's clearly shows you have a product market fit now and, and the company is growing. Can you share some of the lessons learned during the fundraising process? Because you actually raise funding in this difficult period when everybody's talking about oh, the funding is not available and there are a lot of challenges, but you raise a big round in this period. And how should founder find the right investor and build a long-term relationship? Because I think that's a very important. And shout out to Sebastian 
I would say he is one of your biggest ambassador because everywhere he go, he talk about no traffic. He say, this is one of my portfolio company. You should always look and check it out. So <laughs> how do you find the right investor? <laughs> um, so uh, the, again, the way I look at it is, is, by the way, it's true for investors and true for employees. It's true for anyone in the company. Uh, all of us are waking up in the morning and we're coming here to work. And we want to have a working environment that that um, we feel comfortable, unrelated to titles, unrelated to a hierarchy, unrelated to anything. And I think that that's kind of something when we are bringing anyone from from employees to investors, it's all about the people. Hmm. All right. So uh, you can have a very fancy brand, but if you have no chemistry with with, with the people there, it's it's gonna be difficult. Uh, specifically now when, when the world is going crazy and we're going through crazy times with this pandemic and, and, and economical, uh, economic uh, 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 issues and, and, and potentially recession and, and this kind of stuff, um, the water are rough, right? And you are on a boat and you yeah. want to have the best crew on board because uh, it, it's crazy out there. And I think it's the same thing for investors. Now, the way I look, uh, at investors, it's not just about someone that comes and puts some money and go away. Uh, I personally maintaining good relationship with, with all of our investors. Uh, I keep them updated. I um, ask for their advice. And uh, on a personal level, I, I try to create or not try to create. We just kind of becoming in a very good relationship uh, because it's not just about meeting them once in a quarter in a board meeting. Yeah. Um. And it's, I think it's also make them feel more connected to the company mm. and want to help and want to promote. Now, the other thing that, uh, th this is more from, from my side, I would say, but essentially any investor have at least several companies, right? Mm. Some of them have perhaps like hundreds of companies. Yeah. And I think that your, your mission as a, as a founder, as a CEO, as someone at the trace funds is how do you, how do you ensure that when someone asks this investor, What's your best company? Um, or, or, or give me some insight or some cool things about your portfolio. How do you make sure that, that these people are going to talk about you? Because they're ambassadors. Yeah. And you are in competition with other companies that not necessarily in your space. That can be cybersecurity, that can be medical devices, can be many, many things. Right? But you want to make sure that you kind of stick and sit in his brain when, when someone asks him about any company, uh, your name will come out. And uh, that's a, I think that's a challenge, but uh, this is one of the things that <laughs> uh, I, I'm working a lot on to make sure that, that everyone that's involved in the company will, will actually be a great ambassador. No, that's amazing. Like, I think you, I love your point about saying it's not the money, it's not the title which attract people, it's the environment, the purpose you create for people to come and join in. And that's what I feel more excited to work with startup is because I see like there is a purpose, there is a reason behind it. And and I was listening to somebody yesterday and, and the point they mentioned is the startup solves something which is not clear because if it's clear, anybody could have solved it, but they try to solve a problem or try to solve something which is not even clear and they want to disrupt something. So so finding that higher purpose is very important and bringing like-minded people. So so kudos to you. You are, I mean, doing a great job and and taking forward the company in a great way. And I think it's come from the top, uh, the leadership, like how you want to bring that culture. Now, this is my last question. And, and like you said, I love your point about dynamic world. Our world is changing so rapidly. What trend do you foresee shaping the future of urban mobility and traffic management in next decade? Like, by 2035 or 30, what do you think? And you pointed out that you are using neural network. So do you think neural network or generative AI will play an important role in the next 10 years and will change uh, the whole society and the way we move and maybe work around? So let me try to give you an answer from another angle. Um, so the way I look at it is, is in a way that technology, it's not really interesting. Right, that's that's what I call under the hood. Um, if you ask me, like in twenty years from now, or something like that, what I would like to see, I would like to leave my house, press push a button, Uber or whatever they're gonna call this ride any company, yeah, and it's gonna give me three point five minutes uh, estimation, and in three point five minutes, a vehicle will come, will pick pick me up, 
and it will tell me that the, the ETA for the uh, uh, location is 17 minutes. And I'm going to be there exactly in 17 minutes. This is what I care about. And now we need to make it work, right? <laughs> and in order for, for it to work, uh, we need the right heli company. We need a traffic management company. We need the fleet management company. Uh, we need so many aspects to come together for the simple thing yeah. as concrete estimation, timing, etc. everything to work like a Swiss clock, right? Um, so this is this is what I would like to see. And this is, again, just one example of, of something simple that hmm. in theory, it's, it's almost here, but it will take it a long time until we're going to get to this uh, um, uh, precision. Now, under the hood, if you look on, on what kind of technologies can enable this kind of thing, so obviously AI is playing a huge part. Uh, if it's generative or, or something else, uh, it depends on on the problems that we're trying to solve. Hmm. I think that just thinking about technology and what it can do, um, it's not necessarily the right way. I would usually try to look at the problem and hmm. then think what will be the best way to solve this problem uh, in, in, in the most efficient way, in the most cost, cost efficient way. Um, because otherwise someone else will come and solve it in a much more cost efficient way and, and my company will die, right? So it's not about using certain technologies, blockchain or whatever. Um, it's about defining the problem and realize what's, what's the best way to solve it and mm -hmm. what kind of tools I have today to solve this problem and what kind of tools are going to have in 10 years to solve it. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's the best answer I, I can think of because it's not about technology. It's about what problem you want to solve and how you can solve it a most cost efficient and I would say most convenient way rather than putting 10 layers of technologies. And like you mentioned, so it's it's not going to solve the real problem, which is which is there. So just think about the problem and the problem you rightly said, people want to move around freely, more, more conveniently and more cost efficient way. You don't want to spend too much of money to move around. So you want to make it more economical. So that, thanks for that uh, point. Yeah. And, and again, if you think about think about Ubers today, What's the difference if you have a driver or if you do not have a driver, right? You push the button, it's yeah. essentially get to you, take some time. Uh, by the way, I think that Uber is an amazing technology. Don't, don't get me wrong, right? Um, but it, it doesn't really matter if you have a driver or not. Mm. So we are already in, in a place where we, we, we kind of doing the right steps towards. And I think that we are on, on, on the, right, the right track. But in order to get a drill fine tune. Uh, it's it's just going to take a lot of effort. Oh yeah, yeah. It's not easy. Like that's what people say. the The first ninety nine percent is easy, but the last one percent take hell lot of efforts to to make it hundred percent. So we are kind of there, but not not completed yet. Exactly, and also there's other aspects like safety, etc. If you have a, a autonomous vehicle involved in an accident, uh, the psychological part is is, is huge, right? Because yeah. it's kind of a machine that 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 that. Um, injured or or, 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 or killed someone right? it's something that it's it's unacceptable in a way um whereas when a driver kills someone we as as, as mankind we're kind of accepting that um so i think there's a lot of aspects so it's not just about getting in the fastest way but getting in the safest way mm -hmm. uh paying the lowest price something that will kind of make sense for all of us so there's like a lot of different aspects that have to kind of come together in order to really make it work like a like a well-tuned machine. No, very true. I mean, Uber CEO was recently mentioning, he said, you know, like every day, a lot of people died in the road accident, killed by the human driver. But even if he have one fatality by the machine, it will be headline everywhere. So, <laughs> you yeah. know, the acceptability is still not there. So we don't see machine doing those kind of stuff. So you you are right. It, it takes a lot of efforts to make it happen. No, thank you so much, Tel. I mean, this is like really wonderful conversation. And generally we end our episode with a rapid fire question round. So if you're ready, I'll I'll just fire all the question to you. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, you already hinted like you work in so many different sector and so many different industry, but if you're not in the, if you're not building no traffic right now, what other profession you would have selected and you would be working? Because you said you wanted to go out for finance. So if it's no traffic, what other profession you would have selected? Oh, I have no idea. I, I knew I want to do something, uh, establish something by myself. Uh, traffic was definitely not uh, something I was even thinking about. 
it was just uh, I would say kind of a just all the stars uh, were kind Align. of aligned uh, at that, that point. But um, I, I I don't know. I just knew I, I just knew I'm gonna build something. I I didn't know what it is. So. So it's like traffic have picked you up, not you. So <laughs> yeah, but traffic is is I was obviously very interested in traffic um in general, right? It's it's kind of I don't know if it was cosmetics. Probably I was not even looking at this because it's not not something that I find uh, for me at least, right? A, a domain that 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 kind of get me excited. Uh, but there are other amazing domains. Um, if you look, uh, I mean, there's there's tons of stuff that can be interesting. Oh yeah, that's true. I mean, I mean, there are so many different problems in the world right now. So you always see problem around. Yeah, I think so that agriculture, have... agriculture is is is, is, is a field one? that I find fascinating. And by the way, that's also a huge problem if you if you think about humanity moving forward. And I think there's so much to do over there uh, to improve uh, to improve things. So that that's that's also fascinating for me. So it's like a retirement plan after no traffic. <laughs> <laughs> We still have a long run. We still have a long, long <laughs> still have a long run. I know, I know. It's uh, we yeah. need more, more city with no traffic system. So yeah. now, which is your favorite city in the world and why? Like you have traveled all around. So which is your favorite city? Wow. Um, it means you love all of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow, that's a that's a good one. So I have a, I have a few. Um, I would say that I I I um. I really like the uh, cities that are like on the, the coastline of, uh, of of California. I uh, specifically remember Oceanside. Um, I think it was the name. Yeah, Oceanside. Okay. So you just just like uh, just like the I, I really like the uh, the sea and the beach and the atmosphere. So I just think think it's cool. Um, yeah, but beside of that, um, I mean. Yeah, I'm. <laughs> good question. I I ne never thought about it. I have to say, it's uh mm -hmm. yeah, it's a good question. I I need to think about it. You know, the best answer I got was uh, when one of our guests said the next one. When I asked him like which is your next favorite city, he said the next one. He said all cities are beautiful. So whichever I've mixed in, the next one is my favorite. So, so it's it's a it's a, it's a difficult question to answer because uh, when you visit so many cities, it's hard to remember like what exactly attract you yeah I think every place have its own character um which by the way are, 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 are very different oh, i i frankly like just to see different things mm. right it's super interest, interesting to see different cultures different approaches um i think that what what kind of uh, a bit funny is that every city thing that they are special and that they have uh certain problems that only they are facing yeah, and then you go to the next one, and they think that they are special <laughs> as well, and they have only, only they are also the only one that have these sets of problem. Then you realize that all of them essentially is facing the same, uh, more or less the same issues, which is which is quite funny. Um, yeah, but uh, I need to think about the city uh, question. Okay, so I'll ask you in five year time <laughs> when you have more. So now I don't know if you get too much time to read books and and uh, do something else, but if you're you have any favorite book, which kind of you recommend to people um recently read i think it's a it's a cool book uh, it's called uh, pitch anything um so it was it, it, it's it's about this psychological aspect of 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 like selling pitching um so it's uh, something i find uh, find interesting uh huh. was written by owen clough and um he, he, he's kind of talking about kind of taking the conversation in depth about how the how the brain is kind of like walking and in, 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 um, uh, interpreting some of the uh, things that's happening in the environment, etc. So I I, mm. yeah, I find it interesting. I'll I'll put it in my reading list uh, and read it. I mean, sounds interesting. Pitch anything because that's the life. You know, right now you have to pitch everything in life to your kids, to your family, to the investor, to the employees, to your clients. So it's it's all about pitching. Yeah, uh, I completely agree. <laughs> So my fourth question is, which one thing do you wish you should have learned early in life? <laughs> Tricky one. Um, Anything related to business, personal side, like you feel, okay, I should have learned this early, a little early. Um, oh, it's a good, it's a good question. You, you caught me, you caught me off guard twice. <laughs> <laughs> I need to, I need to, uh, I, I owe you an answer for this as well. Okay. So I'll send you an email and probably we will put in the show notes. Uh, 
this is my last question and this probably will be tricky or uh, it'll be easy it's like if you can change one thing in life what would it be my life or in anything general? in the society or in the life or anything if you can change like if you get a magic wand and say okay tell you can change one thing what will you pick up um like some people said that they want disease to go away some people said they want cars to go away i got this answer like this car should go away <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, i i i don't think i would i would want anything to go away uh, i think the, the only thing perhaps uh, I, i would say is that i think that essentially the vast majority of human being are more or less the same right so i think that the some of the disputes and arguments etc that we have i think that essentially all, all of us want to wake up in the morning uh, have a have a decent work decent life decent health um so i think that the kind of the uh, uh, a lot of things related to territory religious etc worldwide by the way uh, yeah. i think that the vast majority of population essentially you know they can live in one happy village okay <laughs> what some like to do one thing they don't like to do other thing but essentially all of them like 99% of the things are, are more or less the same so uh i don't know if 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 it's something concrete but it's kind of like focusing on on kind of like coming together in a way and 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 and, and putting some of these conflicts aside i love this answer i mean this is i mean i i i, I agree with you it's like i see everybody same and i don't understand why they are fighting so i feel like man everybody has same problem why don't you just take care of things which are important to you and and don't try to trouble others true uh, that's the point eventually everyone lose right so what's the point if you, if you kind of think about it in a more mature way in a grown up way it's like it doesn't just make sense happy. just be happy <laughs> just be happy and let yeah. other be happy <laughs> no, i mean look you have so many challenges as 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 been kind that we need to face health challenges and yeah. and, and resources and food etc we have enough big things to uh, to face which which not necessarily directly related to us right global warming for instance um it is related to us but i uh, think that we kind of uh, uh, need to think about together as a main kind how we can how we can make sure that our existence on on this planet will we we last um also for our, uh, our kids and 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 moving forward uh, and i think that this is kind of like the big big thing that we as 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 mankind have to be united around and think together yeah no i i call it like an entrepreneurial mindset it's like we already have so many problem to solve so why don't you spend your time energy eff- efforts to solve those problem rather than wasting your life on on doing trivial things so no i love i love exactly. your point i love your <laughs> point see if you get more time you think better so <laughs> 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 no thank you so much tell i mean i love our conversation i really enjoyed i think some of the perspective you shared um, it it give me new ideas and i'm pretty sure the listener who will be listening to this will get some new idea from this conversation So so thank you for your time. I know you have a busy schedule but thank you taking out this time and sharing your experience and learning with us. Great conversation. Thanks for the questions. Uh I really enjoyed and uh I look forward to uh see you around conferences and stuff events <laughs> whatever. For sure somewhere in the world. Somewhere in the world. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this podcast. If you like this episode, please don't forget to give us a five star rating as it will help us to spread our message. If you have any feedback or suggestion for this podcast, please feel free to reach out to us at info@mobility-innovator.com. At I look forward to see you next time. Thank you.